Hi, I'd firstly like to welcome all our panelists and I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today uh, on our live panel. We're very, very glad to have you all join us for the first day of the Smart Protein Summit. So, you know, just in our previous session, you heard Varun Deshpande, GFI India's Managing Director, speak about the state of industry today, where we're at. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what needs to change to actually get to a place where we want to be in the next few years. And as we all know, corporations or uh, companies that are working within the sector are key pieces of this puzzle. And there is a clear reason why, right? Um, they're closely involved with the food system. Uh, what they make actually influences what consumers buy. Uh, they also have some of the best minds working to solve complex issues of innovation as well as distribution. And uh, we have some of them joining us today uh, during this panel itself. Uh, GFI India engages with several corporate organizations and we try and help them solve key challenges as well as actually address changes that they're making in the system across the value chain, some of whom, of course, are our wonderful sponsors um, and the companies that have joined us today in the panel as well. So without further ado, I would just, uh, you know, introduce each of our panelists uh, before and give them a chance to say hello to you all before I actually delve into specific questions that I have for each of them. So, uh, you know, to begin with, we have Karuna Jayakrishna, who is the head of innovation at DuPont in South Asia. She leads an integrated team of application specialists and technologists who are focused on creating novel applications of DuPont in reading technologies and solutions for both consumer packaged goods and for their food service customer base. She has more than 15 years of experience and has published multiple technical articles in leading journals on plant-based foods as well as protein nutrition. Hi, Karuna. Welcome to the panel. Hi, Dhruvi. It's nice to be here today. Next up, we have Natasha Tiseski. She is a process technologist at Wenger Manufacturing with a background in chemistry as well as chemical engineering. The potential impact of what extrusion as a technology holds, um, and especially the impact for food security, is what sparked her interest in technology, as well as its utilization across various industry sectors to improve lives, as well as to transform processing. As a result, she has been advising and supporting companies on extrusion processing technologies since 2012. Hi, Natasha. Welcome. Hi, Dravi. Thank you for having us. Next up, we have Siddharth Mangram. He is the Interim Country General Manager India for the fascinating company Live Kindly Co, which is a unique collective of founders, entrepreneurs, and investors who are advancing the smart protein industry. Its brands include the Fry Family Food Co, Like Meat, and Live Kindly, of course. Siddharth brings with him 20 plus years of experience across startups, technology, management consulting, and FMCG, from leading firms like Coca-Cola, McKinsey, and Co as well as Microsoft. He has recently been an active entrepreneur in India over a decade, and uh, so he knows the Indian innovation ecosystem well as well. More on that later. Hi, Siddharth. Welcome. Hello there. Thanks for having us. Last but not the least, we have Niall Sands, who is the president of Plant-Based Foods at AK, which is, of course, a huge company with over 100 plus years of experience in innovating and customizing solutions based on vegetable oils and fats. He has worked there for the last four years, but has 16 years of experience across retail and food service in the food industry. He's worked in both B2B as well as B2C streams uh, in the Europe and Latin American markets. And from his current base in Ireland, Niall is leading AK's pioneering work and their AcoPlanet portfolio of fats for plant-based foods. Hi, Niall. We're glad you could make it. Hi, Ruby. Thanks for the invite. Delighted to be here. Awesome. So what I'm going to do next is I'll just talk to each of you about the specific work you are doing in the plant-based food sector before we go into questions, um, you know, which are more conversational and open for all of us. So I hope that works for everybody. Um, I'd like to begin with Karuna. Uh, you know, DuPont, of course, as we all know, is a key player in the global ingredients landscape. And you've recently launched the Planet line of ingredients in India which is to help food formulators actually make some great tasting plant-based products. So could you tell us a little bit more about the work you're doing to help companies make a splash in the space? Sure. Thanks, Dhruvi. Thanks for the question. Um, and, and again, it's a pleasure to be here today on this panel talking on smart proteins. Um, I've been uh, personally working in this plant protein space for more than a decade now. 
and uh, DuPont as an organization has uh, several decades of experience in this plant protein space. Um, and uh, we have been very committed uh, to this uh, sector. Um, and uh, recently at DuPont, we launched uh, Denesco Planet, uh, which is a comprehensive range of uh, ingredients for plant-based foods. Uh, it includes uh, functional ingredients like proteins, like the super soy protein. We have uh, pea protein, uh, a lot of uh, uh, textured proteins, which mimic uh, meat-like texture, uh, and a whole range of hydrocolloids, emulsifiers, enzymes, uh, veggie cultures, uh, all of these ingredients which are very relevant uh, to make uh, products in this vegetable-based uh, products. Um, and along with this, what I would like to highlight here is, um, uh, you know, through Planet, what we are bringing to our customers is more than ingredients. Uh, it is our application expertise. Uh, it is our technical know-how. Uh, it is a market insights, uh, the sensory expertise, uh, and, 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 you know, essentially the whole approach we have towards this market space. Um, and we work very closely with our customers, uh, right from conceptualization till commercialization. Um, and uh, uh, we are a global science organization, uh, but we also truly believe uh, that science is global, uh, but taste is local. Uh, and in order to support our customers uh, locally, uh, we have a state-of-the-art application center, uh, which is based in Gurgaon. Uh, so here we have uh, pilot scale facilities uh, through which you know, we can work along with our customers uh, to reduce their time uh, for product development, um, uh, tackle the scale up issues. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, proprietary uh, market and consumer uh, research information uh, through which we can anticipate consumer likings uh, through which uh, we help our customers launch innovative solutions which are locally relevant in the market. So we are, uh, we are completely excited about this uh, market and uh, I think um, uh, we're looking forward to uh, leading uh, this trend from the front. Thanks. Thank you, Karuna. I think uh, science being global and taste being local is um, a really, really good way to put, I think, uh, a lot of insights that we've been talking about uh, since the summit has begun as well. So thank you for that. Uh, moving on to Niall, so, you know, since we're on the topic of ingredients, AquaPlanet and AAK, of course, is focused on giving plant-based foods this juiciness and a better mouthfeel, uh, which are, of course, critical components of plant-based meats and dairy. So could you give us some insight into AAK's global forays into the sector as well? Indeed, I'd be happy to. Um, so in, in AAK, we have uh, created uh, a global platform for plant-based foods focusing in particular on dairy and, and meat. Uh, and that is called AcoPlanet. Um, and with that, what we've recognized in AAK uh, with regards to plant-based food is that there's a fundamental role of oils and fats um, in the application in order to deliver the functionality, but also that uh, sensory experience that consumers are looking for, which has no compromises. So that is our goal, that we want to deliver uh, a plant-based product that doesn't compromise on taste, texture, and that overall sensory uh, experience. So we've been busy resourcing this new business unit in AAK over the past number of months, and you know, with regards to talent and assets, ultimately to support um, our regional go-to-market teams right across the world. So with functions in terms of innovation, business development, product management, insights, and strategic marketing, we all work together here at the center in order to support our efforts in the region. And we're tailoring uh, our approach to the, the taste preferences, the cultures and the traditions uh, of our key markets. So the global support team is very much there to support our regional go-to-market teams and help customers in this young and emerging food category. Uh, it's hugely exciting. Uh, there's so much activity here. Uh, and our focus is not just on retail, but it's on food service as well. We recognize that food service will be as important to plant-based foods um, as the retail channel. And therefore, some of the big challenges that we're looking at is with regard to plant-based meat, which I think is important for the Smart Protein Summit. And our objective is very simple. We want it to look like meat, we want it to cook like meat, and we want it to taste like meat. So whenever you look at the, the fundamental building blocks of that with regards to the visuals, the cooking experience, and then the succulence and the juicy that the consumer is looking for, 
those are all attributes and objectives of ours as we develop uh, our Acroplanet portfolio to deliver against those taste preferences that consumers are looking for. And again, they're looking for a taste experience with no compromise. Absolutely. I think taste is key. Taste is probably, uh, you know, of course, along with uh, price and convenience, the cornerstone for any food product and more so when it comes to plant-based meat. So I couldn't agree more. Um, I'll just come back to you in just a minute, uh, Niall. I'll move on to Natasha and talk about manufacturing capability as a key component of the plant-based ecosystem, uh, you know, to actually bring products to life and to bring them to market. Wenger, of course, has been a leader in equipment as well as manufacturing partnerships globally. So could you please let us know a little bit more about the work that you do, Natasha, and um, especially from an India point of view, of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce ourselves here. Um, so as you might know, we support industry with complete process solutions with extrusion and drying technologies. And throughout the years, Winger has supported production of plant-based proteins for multiple reasons, with nutrition being one of the main drivers because behind our initial intent of uh, delving into this research area in the 1960s. Since then, numerous food processors have relied on our equipment for production of nutritious foods and specifically for production of texture proteins. Obviously, we support up other applications as well, in addition to texture proteins, as extrusion really has a wide um, range of applications. Uh, since the beginning, we've started to support entrepreneurs and corporates with developing understanding of the various factors at play in developing applications with extrusion processing. And since the initial research recorded around the application of extrusion processing to texture proteins, we've been working with industry in developing um, different textures, as well as building our understanding of ingredients, which is quite important in this space. Um, as Niall mentioned, uh, texture, um, eating experience, and taste are quite important in this area. And really understanding of all the factors that go into behind this process um, has been our driver for us. And we've been working in this space, as I said, since the 1960s. So we have over six years of both process and service knowledge in addition to our equipment understanding and knowledge. Um, we established a technical center in 1965 in our headquarters. And this was with the intent to allow industry to be, have access to a facility where they can develop applications with extrusion. And that center is still existing. We are completing our renovations this year. And typically, uh, we offer industries and entrepreneurs the kind of service where they can actually come and develop their product before they are making a decision whether or not it makes sense for them to invest in equipment. Our equipment to food safety, food security, and alleviation of malnutrition drives our continuous innovation in this space. And global sustainability has been a driver for a lot of changes in food processing recently. And we see this through the diversification of ingredients, which are key, I believe, in terms of having a sustainable food system. And through educating and sharing our knowledge and understanding of ingredients, technology, and process, um, we strive to support industry and entrepreneurs. And with that, we also support research institutions and universities with process and equipment understanding, as well as supporting technical um, workshops where people can come and learn about the technology. So with respect to supporting India in terms of technology, we do have several customers that do manufacture products um, in India with our equipment. And I believe they themselves uh, oftentimes offer entrepreneurs and other companies to actually visit their facilities. I won't mention their names. Um, they can reach out, people can reach out to them. I'm sure a lot of them know who they are. Um, in terms of supporting this space, we would be very excited to see twin screw extrusion applications in this space. Uh, primarily, we see single screw extruders in this area. And um, we think the industry has been heading towards twin screw extruders since the early 2000s. So with that in mind, um, yeah, that's basically our summary about our company. And we're very excited to see developments in the plant protein space. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. That was awesome. I'll just come back, uh, you know, towards the later half of our panel, more onwards to the collaboration that you mentioned and more onwards to how startups can actually collaborate with you. Um, now, moving on to the extreme end of the spectrum. So we spoke about ingredients. Uh, we also spoke about manufacturing. But now getting into, you know, consumers and talking to Siddharth, uh, you know, about the Live Kindly Co. It's such an interesting company that's focusing on investing in as well as acquiring brands. 
um, and creating your own line of plant-based food, Siddharth. So could you give us some insight into this unique approach and um, how you're thinking about this? Sure. So, you know, the Live Kindly Collective is a global platform of entrepreneurs, global leaders, investors. And um, you're right, we have acquired a few marquee brands, including Fry's Foods, um, Like Meat and uh, Oomph. We also have a play in the content space. And so Live Kindly as a brand is also a content platform that's used for education, because we think that there's a long way to go globally around um, educating the world on uh, plant-based uh, protein. And um, the other thing that really makes uh, Live Kindly very unique um, is the fact that, you know, we are the only global pure play in plant protein. So there are many um, localized plays, and there are also global plays of large MNCs that, that do uh, plant protein, but ours is a pure play and that is global. The way we um, slice the market is in terms of uh, core markets. Our core markets are the US, um, UK, Germany, South Africa, and China. And our extended core is um, India. And of course, um, you know, my role is to is to make an assessment um, of you know, how and when we enter the, the market. And it is um, very likely that you know, India in, the due, in due course will be, if not the largest, one of the largest plant-based protein markets um, in the globe. And so um, the, the, the opportunity of course is, is massive for us, um, for all of us as a collective and, and as well as uh, across the spectrum of the, the value chain. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, my role over here is to, is to um, really do an assessment of how and when we get into the, the Indian market. And, you know, happy to talk to folks across the value chain about uh, how we can collaborate. Thank you, Siddharth. That was indeed a very unique perspective. And I love the way you guys are thinking about also educating consumers at the same time through your media portal. So that's right. definitely unique. Um, I think we can't move on with any discussion in today's climate without actually addressing what we're all facing together as a world at large, um, you know, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. So this question is to all of you. Um, you know, we feel that especially in this industry, like all other industries, there have been serious disruptions. Um, you know, from delays in R&D to restaurant launches being postponed, uh, which was, of course, key to some startups entering the market. Um, and while all this is happening, at the same time, we also see impossible foods and beyond meat, uh, you know, that are doing very well. Demand has skyrocketed for those brands, especially with home chefs trying their products for the first time. So how would you each describe this year's developments, particularly with respect to new markets like India? And, um, you know, has it really impacted the partners that you're working with or the way you are working with partners, many of whom, of course, are startups and may not have uh, that much shock absorbing power as the bigger corporates do. So um, this is open to everyone. Uh, you know, you can jump in and answer. Sure, maybe I can take a shot at it first. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, Dhruvi, all that you mentioned are uh, very true. Um, and uh, I think food industry uh, has been impacted, but, uh, but I believe, uh, you know, relatively compared to some non-food industries, um, I think the impact has been relatively lesser. Um, and, um, uh, you know, again, in terms of the food industry, there are different categories which are impacted to a different uh, extent. Uh, one of the categories which is massively impacted is the food service uh, QSR uh, category. Uh, with uh, with people um, stuck at home due to lockdowns and um, uh, you know the trend of uh, consuming home cooked food uh, from a safety perspective um, and and also with uh, with work from home being the norm and uh, with children having online classes at home and uh, pretty much everybody at home restricted um, uh, you know, inside the home. Uh, I think one of the things which is happening is uh, the number of eating occasions at home has increased drastically, uh, which has brought an emphasis on uh, requirement of uh, uh, convenient retail solutions, uh, which make cooking less cumbersome and more convenient. Uh, we have seen some increased demand in products like uh, long shelf life rotis, cooking aids, um, 
um, and even breads, um, and also with uh, with eating out occasions reduced. Um, you know, some of the indulgent products like snacks um, and baked products, chocolates. Um, there is there has been an increased demand uh, for these products. Uh, and secondly, uh, because of COVID, um, you know, there is an increased emphasis on health and wellness. Um, I think uh, consumers are becoming much more conscious on what they are eating. Uh, there has been more conscious uh, eating. So, so products which uh, help consumers in terms of uh, meeting their uh, health and wellness go uh, goals and uh, the products which have immunity uh, boosting benefits, um, you know, they have been doing uh, really well. Um, and, and also because of uh, the nature of the COVID virus, um, and I think in general, the perception of plant-based foods to be uh, much more safe uh, and good for health versus uh, meats, uh, that, is, that, is that is also coming up very obviously. Uh, and, uh, and the third aspect I would say is um, uh, in terms of affordability, uh, I think this has been there. Uh, you know, when we look at it from an Indian perspective, uh, but now I think it has, uh, it has become much more pronounced. Um, value for money proposition, how do you optimize cost? Um, I think this is an area which is, uh, which is gaining more interest in the recent uh, context. Right. Uh, so I would say it has been, uh, uh, you know, some of the categories have been impacted like the food service, um, ice creams, juices also, uh, but uh, the categories which cater to health and wellness um, and also, uh, you know, bring in a convenience proposition. Uh, we have seen, um, uh, you know, pretty stable or increased demand for these products. Right. Yeah. I, I think through the, um, the word disruptor is often used with respect to breakthrough innovation and as a consequence, plant-based foods. But uh, 2020 has been the year of disruption and reprioritization as a consequence, unfortunately, not uh, innovation, but a viral borne disease, uh, COVID-19, which has caused you know, untold damage across the world. Um, and what I would say is regardless of whether, you know, you're a business that has billion dollar brands or you're a startup looking your first listing in the marketplace, now more than ever cash is king. Um, and therefore considering the cost to launch, but more importantly to market, to ensure that product sticks in the market and is successful. Um, those plans are being rethought by a lot of companies, given the fact that there is reduced and suppressed in-store activity, either in the supermarket or, or in the restaurant. Um, so those, are, those plans are either being rethought by customers or they're being delayed for, for better times. Um, but with that, you know, opportunity does arise. Um, and I suppose it's given us an opportunity to refocus ourselves and structure ourselves for even greater success. So we've been busy looking at our current portfolio and going through iterative improvements uh, of those prototype solutions with three objectives again, uh, continuous improvement to deliver better nutritional, better sustainability credentials, uh, and a better eating and drinking experience of those products with our customers. So disruption, yes, but it allows us to keep busy internally um, working on improvement. Uh, so whenever the time is right, we can bring these to market and launch successfully with our customers. That sounds perfect. Anyone else would like to comment on this before we begin to the next question? Yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll go next. And I'll, I, I agree with uh, what Karuna and Anil have said. Um, you know, what, what we're seeing is, of course, an acceleration, perhaps, of what was already underway. And, and, we, and you know, our industry, uh, and when I say our industry, I mean the entire plant um, protein uh, ecosystem is not unique in this. We're seeing it across uh, financial services. We're seeing it across retail. And in India, I think in particular, we're going to be seeing, you know, leapfrogging from the unorganized sector to a lot of people moving directly online for their purchases, skipping the modern trade um, channel completely. Right. So I think that transition is something that will be very interesting to to watch. And, and you know, building on what Karuna said about um, health and uh, the concerns around, you know, zoonotic uh, diseases. I mean, this is the third pandemic that we're having in, in the last 20 years. Right. So there's, um, you know, we've dealt with SARS. We've dealt with um, 
H1N1, both of which were from, um, you know, animals. And then we've had, you know, not pandemics, but, but certainly serious diseases like uh, Ebola, um, MERS, that have also come from, from um, animals. And of course, there's a, there's a whole set of reasons for that. So I think that is something that we also will be seeing accelerating globally, as well as within, within the country. Uh, how it plays out, I think, is going to be very interesting. And uh, what, what, what I think we are seeing is definitely an acceleration. And, and we're still in the middle of this pandemic, right? And especially in, in India, it's, it's still, you know, I mean, the numbers are not very encouraging. So, um, so the sense that, that we have is uh, it's just going to make things move faster in a, in a lot of ways. And, um, and I think it's also going to mean a lot of innovation, again, not just in our industry, but if you look at, you know, brands or companies like ITC, Dabur, uh, Hindusan, Unilever, etc., the number of product launches that they have made during the you know, since since March has been tremendous. And I think that's, uh, that's, you know, it's a reflection of what really the world and and the Indian market uh, needs. And I think we're going to see something very similar in our ecosystem. Absolutely, I agree. So, you know, I mean, looking at the panel in general, we have diverse representation, right? Each of your companies is doing something completely different from the others. Uh, we have ingredients, we have uh, specialty oils and fats, manufacturing, as well as live kindly with this unique uh, holding style, you know, hybrid PE approach. So it's clear that this is a very collaborative sector and we'll have to face um, any challenge that we're facing, you know, be it the coronavirus pandemic or any innovation that comes as a result of that together. So keeping that in mind, uh, you know, would each of you like to highlight clear opportunity areas as well as clear challenges that you see in working together as a holistic ecosystem? And um, I'd like to begin with uh, Natasha. So in terms of what challenges are we seeing in the system, it really is regionally dependent. Uh, primarily when it comes to India, since this is our focus of our talk today, uh, the key things that I would say I probably see is technology, not that technology isn't available, extrusion processing technologies as well as other technologies for handling texture proteins are available and uh, they're scalable and commercially um, feasible, um, as is proven by a lot of companies that already possess this technology. However, the bottleneck with respect to this area, it really is something that was highlighted by, um, by the Just uh, group as well, and that is the final product creation and the distribution of products, the cold chain system, um, as well as diversification of ingredients and utilization of these ingredients that can be used to texturize proteins. So in terms of what we see as potential areas for growth and development, these are the ones um, that we see as potential bottlenecks for the market in India. Um, and some of the products that are really performing well in more developed markets, such as Northern America and Europe, um, might have some challenges to deal with, especially since those products oftentimes require a cold chain system. Um, and there has to be a different approach to potentially distributing some of these products or preserving them. Because once you start going into the high moisture meat analogs, which are the newer products in this category, um, we start to really look at proper handling and food safety being a concern. Um, Karuna, uh, Karuna comes from DuPont and, and uh, they provide texture proteins as far as I understand. And those products are really great in terms of being able to um, handle um, in terms of the dry texture proteins because they are shelf stable um, and they provide a lot of opportunity for diversity in textures. And their utilization into finished products um, definitely allows for opportunities to bypass some of these challenges of the cold chain system. That's from our perspective. Right, thank you. Nile, would you like to comment, especially looking at uh, you know, a global brand um, and a local market like India? So how would you approach this? Indeed, I think the single biggest opportunity that I see, and it's regardless if you're based in Mumbai or San Francisco, is the need to forge effective collaboration uh, throughout the supply chain. Um, this is a new and emerging 
uh, area, a lot of it underpinned uh, by technology and breakthroughs in, in food science uh, and food technology, with the ultimate quest of you know developing great tasting plant-based products, as I said earlier, with no compromises. Um, so this effective blend of various stakeholders, be it ourselves, equipment manufacturers, other peer ingredient companies, along with brand owners, um, that makes for a very potent uh, mix. And I, I also think that whenever you look at it through the, the lens of plant-based meat, which is very savory led, once you bring that science and technology and then add in the culinary chef and the culinary arts and those skills, well then you are, you're starting to pull together uh, a very interesting way of working to bring innovation to the marketplace. So I think uh, the forging of those partnerships with like-minded organizations with the ultimate goal of doing what's right for the consumer, I think is the single biggest opportunity, be it, as I said, in Mumbai, Europe, or the US. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. I think collaboration is the way forward, especially for such a new industry and in India in specific as well. So, you know, Karuna is someone who's you know, you're constantly basically thinking about the most cutting edge solutions for satisfying consumer demand. So what are some of the key aspects when it comes to product development that you need to keep in mind when you're looking at specifically the Indian market and the Indian taste? Sure. Thanks, Truy. Yes, uh, specifically from an innovation perspective, uh, it has been an exciting time for us uh, from past uh, couple of years. Uh, where we have been looking at developing locally relevant uh, solutions, concepts, uh, ideas, um, you know, in this uh, meat alternative and uh, plant-based food space. Uh, and we are also very closely tuned in to some of the regional and global developments. Um, and we do leverage a lot of technical learnings uh, from our global colleagues. Uh, but there are many things which we need to keep into consideration from a local Indian perspective. Uh, of course, uh, first and foremost, I think it's important to understand the regulations and uh, really uh, understand the boundaries under which uh, you can develop the products. Um, and and from, a, from a consumer insight, uh, if I have to give an example, um, you know, we, we ran a consumer research on ready to drink beverages, uh, where uh, we clearly understood uh, that Indian consumers uh, prefer beverages, uh, which are thicker um, and have richer mouthfeel. And uh, globally, if you look at this plant based beverages, they have very thin texture. Uh, so from an Indian perspective, when you're developing the product, uh, you know, it's very important to consider these aspects. And now in this case, how do we make the product, um, you know, thicker, have a richer mouthfeel uh, by selecting the right uh, ingredients in terms of hydrocolloids or proteins uh, that becomes extremely critical. Um, and also uh, in terms of, I mean, you know, uh, Natasha and, uh, you know, the other panelists also talked about distribution. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have very extreme temperature conditions in India. Uh, so when you are designing the product, it's important to design it in such a way that it's able to withstand uh, the extreme uh, temperature conditions. Um, and also from an end consumer perspective, um, if I have to continue on this plant-based beverage example, um, you know, if we uh, look at a dairy milk, uh, the way we consume is uh, we tend to boil it uh, for five to 10 minutes, mix it with uh, coffee, tea. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you're developing products here for Indian consumers, it's very important to understand, you know, how this product is going to be consumed by the end consumer, uh, whether it's going to be taken directly from the carton, uh, Tetra Pak carton, or it's going to be boiled to uh, make, uh, you know, different beverages. Exactly. Uh, There's so much to consider, right, when it comes to yes. India, especially with like different kinds of cooking techniques. So that's great. Thank yes. you. Actually, I'd like to open a question for all of you now before I jump into the audience seated uh, Q&A, because I think we'll be running out of time soon. Um, so I'll just move on to that one um, and just ask all of you, and this is kind of continuing the stream of thought that Karuna shared, which is in India, you need to look at very different permutations, combinations, you need to look at localization, and you're also faced, I think, with challenges when it comes to infrastructure. So, you know, be it from a regulatory standpoint or from a storage standpoint. So um, could you give us some insights about specific efforts that your companies have taken to really work 
uh, within this unique atmosphere and really contextualize and localize your offerings. And this is again open to everyone. From an AAK perspective, you know, whilst we are a, a global ingredients company, um, the one thing that we, we have and which we exhibit day to day is that we have empowered uh, and decentralized the business model with local management teams. So, you know, whilst I am not based in India, we have a very, very strong local uh, management team um, in India and in other key markets that absolutely understand the, the local cultures, the local traditions, the regulations, um, the norms and the behaviors. And whilst we um, have aspirations for, for global standards, we very much tailor those to, um, to the local market. So within India, we have that uh, through our enterprise in Kimani um, in, in Mumbai. So we are able to, to tailor um, you know, our proposition very much uh, to to the local market. I think if we were did not have that asset in India, it would be much more difficult. But the fact that we have you know boots on the ground uh, ensures that we're very much in sync with what's going on, and I think that's part of our our success um, with uh, with AAK Kamani. Thank you. Sure, Dhruvi. Uh, from, a, <clears throat> from a DuPont perspective, um, I think one of the areas we are focusing um, is, uh, you know, how do we make this products, uh, uh, you know, move from try it once uh, to becoming a, re becoming a regular part of uh, the diet. Uh, so currently, if you, if you look at it, uh, you know, there are fewer options uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the product categories. Uh, we typically see some westernized concepts like uh, the burger patties or, uh, you know, the pizza toppings. Uh, but I think going forward, uh, if, if uh, you know, this flexitarian trend and plant-based trend has to uh, get a wider market, um, uh, you know, base, I think it's important to make it uh, relevant in wider product formats. Um, you know, localize it uh, in terms of Indian taste and texture preference. Uh, you know, how do you make it relevant in a biryani or how do you make it relevant in uh, a butter chicken uh, kind of product? Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, getting the taste and texture uh, and uh, the cost aspect is also uh, something which is very critical. And uh, in terms of uh, working towards this, uh, in, in the beginning also I mentioned about our application center. Uh, this is something uh, you know we we work on on a pretty much regular basis on new concepts, new ideas, uh, which are uh, most of them are ready to take to market as such. Um, and also, it is also about speed to market. Uh, so that is what we bring to our customers uh, that we reduce the development times. Uh, be it, uh, you know, meat alternative or plant-based beverages and, um, you know, uh, help them get into the market sooner than later. Sure. So I think we have time for just one audience question and I'd like to open Slido and, you know, move on to the audience poll for that before we have to uh, end today's panel. So I think I know, uh, you know, from going through these while the panel was on as well, one that would be very, very pertinent to our entire audience as well. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you, how are you really seeking to collaborate with uh, entrepreneurs and other corporations in India? So any specific collaborations or partnerships you have in mind that you'd like to talk about, especially with startups, um, I think, and on corporates in the sector in India? Sure. Uh, you know, I'll go. I'll go first on that. Um, you know, as as I've mentioned, you know, Live Kindly is a platform, a global platform for entrepreneurs and global leaders to address this opportunity um, of plant based protein. And so, you know, we are constantly in touch with uh, players across the entire value chain. You know, whether they're entrepreneurs, whether it's folks who are you know my co panelists across different aspects of the of the of the value chain. And, um, you know, my contact details are available. So, you know, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. So if any of you have something that could be of interest to uh, the Live Kindly Collective, please reach out to me through the uh, duration of this conference, you know, ping me on LinkedIn and, and I'll be happy to connect with um, each one of you to, to discuss how we can uh, work together. 
Yep. Sounds- from an AAK from an AAK perspective, Adrian, you'll have to say that um, from my perspective, uh, the Good Food Institute India has been a fantastic enabler to allow AAK uh, to meet and engage with companies of all sizes right across India. Uh, I am fortunate to work with uh, my colleagues, uh, as I said, in AAK Kamani, and in particular Diraj, who is the uh, the let's say the AAK go-to person for for GFI India, and certainly that has over the past number of months uh, facilitated a large number of uh, conversations with uh, startups and and different organizations within India, which I think wouldn't ordinarily have happened if we weren't part of GFI India. So this for me has been a a great enabler to to promote conversations that might otherwise have had to happen with uh, Dheeraj on the team uh, in Mumbai. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have to call the session to an end. I'd encourage all of you to keep in touch uh, with each other as well as the audience via the platform through the next uh, you know, few days. Please use the social lounge, connect with each other. Um, I'd again like to thank all of you so much for you know, spending this afternoon uh, listening in as well as the panelists for sharing these insights. It's been great. Um, I had a really good time and I hope all of you will be tuned into the next session that's coming up right after the networking break, uh, which is basically focused more on startups and looking at various different startups that are doing exciting work in the sector. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.